which has been duly sanctioned according to law for the celebration of marriage. My name is Pam Strevens, and I will conduct your ceremony today together with my colleague Leslie, who will register and record the marriage details. And we're here today to witness the joining in marriage of Frank and Emma, who through their vows are making a commitment to each other. And I know it means a great deal to them both that you are all here today to celebrate their love, acknowledge their union, and support them in their new lives together as husband and wife. And now I must ask, who gives Emma in marriage? Can you say I do? <coughs> Thank you, Matthew. Very good. If you'd just like to take a seat there, and if you'd like to take a seat there, please come through and take your seat here. Yours alongside me here. Yes. That's lovely. And Frank alongside you. Thank you. Now the ceremony will be held in accordance with the civil law of this country, which requires both bride and groom to declare their freedom to marry and to solemnly promise to take each other as partners for life. So if any person knows of a lawful impediment preventing this marriage, they should declare it now. <coughs> Having your good authority that you've been handpicked to be here today, that entitles you all to smile. So Frank and Emma, marriage begins with a wedding where two people promise to have and to hold, to love and to cherish, come what may. The happiness in marriage comes from knowing that the love you share will grow ever stronger as you go through life together. And the blessings of marriage are the fulfillment of your cherished hopes and dreams as your lives unfold. And now, before you are joined in matrimony, I have to remind you both of the solemn and binding character of the vows that you're about to take to each other. Marriage, according to the law of this country, is the union of one man with one woman, voluntarily entered into for life, to the exclusion of all others. And the vows you've chosen to make are of a twofold nature, the first, to ensure there is no legal hindrance to your marriage, and in the second, you contract your vows to take each other as husband and wife. And now I'm going to ask you both a question, and if it is correct, the response should be, I do. And in time on a fashion, Frank, we start with the room. Frank, do you take Emma to be your lawful wedded wife? I do. And Emma, do you take Frank to be your lawful wedded husband? I do. If I can ask you please to stand and turn and face each other. So if you'd like to put the bag down, if you want to pass your flowers over to your bride's head. And perhaps if you link hands with Frank, because the time has now come for the two of you to make a legal declaration of your freedom to marry. And this time, Frank, I'm going to ask you to repeat the words after me, but to say them to your bride. I declare that I know. I declare that I know. Of no legal reason. Of no legal reason. Of no. Of no. Sorry. That's all right. Of no legal reason. Of no legal reason. Why I, Francis Ashley Thomas Crosby. Why I, Francis Ashley Thomas Crosby. May not be joined. May not be joined. In marriage. In marriage. To Emma Jane Rose. To Emma Jane Rose. To Emma Jane Rose. That's lovely. And Emma, those same words to your groom. I declare that I know. I declare that I know. Of no legal reason. Of no legal reason. Why I, Emma Jane Rose. Why am I, Emma Jane Rose. May not be joined. May not be joined. In marriage. In marriage. To Francis Ashley Thomas Crosby. To Francis Ashley Crosby. Thomas. Thomas Crosby. That's lovely. Thank you very much. That's the first part of your ceremony completed. If you'd like to just take your seats because it gives me great pleasure to invite <coughs> Carol to step forward with the first poem. <coughs> I wandered lonely as a clown that floats on high o'er dales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beneath the lake, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of the bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid their sparkling leaves in glee. A poet could not be but gay in such a joke and company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth to show me had brought. For off when on my couch I lay in vacant and in pensive mood, 
they fresh upon that that inward eye, which is the bless the bless of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. A little support, I think. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's also part of a long tradition in this country that the marriage contract is sealed by the giving and exchange of rings. The rings will symbolize the joining of these two lives in marriage, their love for one another, and by wearing their rings, they'll be known as husband and wife. So, Andrew, could I ask you please to stand and collect the rings and stand next to the room? And if I can ask you again to stand and face each other. <laughs> You take your bride's ring, please, Frank. Place it on the third finger of her left hand and remain holding her ring hand to say these words to her. Emma, as this ring, Emma, as this ring encircles your finger, encircles your finger. Never forget, never forget that your love, that your love encircles my heart. That your circles my heart. You just make that ring comfortable there. And now, Andrew, if I ask you to stand next to the bride and present her with the groom's ring. Again, if you place it on the third finger, the left hand, remain holding Frank's hand to say those words. Frank, as this ring, Frank, as this ring, encircles your finger, encircles your finger, never forget, never forget, that that your love, encircles my heart. Your love encircles my heart. Make those rings comfortable there. And if I can ask Andrew, please, to retake your seat. Thank you very much. And perhaps if you just hold your ring hands together for the photographer to see the ring hands there. Lovely. Right, and now if I could ask, please, for the two witnesses to stand. We've got Matthew Crosby and Jackie Osborne. And if I can ask you to stand one either side of the bride and groom. We now come to the final part of the ceremony where the bride and groom contract their vows to take each other as husband and wife. Once again, Frank, I'm going to ask you to face your bride and say these words to her. I, Francis Ashley Thomas Crosby, take you, Emma Jane Rose, to be my wedded wife. I promise to be loving, loving, faithful, faithful, and loyal to you you in living our lives together. together. And Emma, those same words to you. I, Emma Jane Rose, Rose, take you, Francis Ashley Thomas Crosby, to be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband, I promise to be loving, be lovely, faithful, faithful, and loyal to you, loyal to you, and living our lives together. Now, Frank and Emma, having made your marriage vows to each other, exchanged your rings in front of your witnesses, your guests, your friends and family, Leslie and myself. It gives me the greatest of pleasure to announce you, husband and wife. No prayers written to bless you, I write in white, your soul aflame, bright in the window of your maiden name. No laws written to guard you, I write in white, your hands in mine, palm against palm, lifeline, heartline. No rules written to guide you, I write in white, words on the wind traced with a stick where we walk on the sand. No news written to tell you, I write it white, foam on the wave as we lift up our skirts in the sea wade. Sea lust, gold sun, behind clouds, ink, water and moonlight. No poems written to praise you, I write them white. Well now ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask if you just chat amongst yourselves for a few moments whilst we get the bride to complete all the necessary paperwork. And then in a few minutes time, if you've brought cameras with you, we will invite you to step forward and take some photos. <laughs> 
He's tonguing it. Is he? Yeah, I see it. I zoomed right in on that. Did I see it? The giggles a little oh, bit, like, didn't you? Bless. Because yeah, I was watching her eyes in that, like, was that laughing? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what it was. I'm trying to cheer you up. Elizabeth, 
for the prize, mate. Yeah, Give us a round of applause here. Yeah. Um, I'd also just like to say well done to Frank for turning up actually because I was uh, a bit worried about him this morning. Um, I don't know if I'm a friend of Clunkin last time or anything, but he looked petrified when I got around the first thing today. Um, but I don't know how you felt, mate, because I mean, this is the fifth time I've had to go for warm seat today with a piece of paper in my hand, so that was a hard pass to fight. Um, they say the best man's speech is the worst few minutes of a groom's life. Fortunately, it's nearly over. I'm lucky if you know him, man. You always mind me, come play once a night. <laughs> I think you'd all agree it was a lovely service, and I think you'd also agree that it looked absolutely great. Yeah. Really, yeah. absolutely great. Yeah. Another round of applause, yeah. <laughs> As for Frank, <sighs> well, it's only actually the second time I've ever seen him in a suit. <laughs> the first time being when I bumped into up London once, and he told me he was auditioning for the Chitton House. <laughs> Um, I don't think he got the job though because uh, for the last 10 years after that he was baking uh, cakes and bread for Tesco, so I'm a lucky fella. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're Frank Carson to be his best man today, it's quite an honour. But then again, being best man is quite a straightforward task nowadays. I mean, all I had to do was get into the church on time, help him get over any nerves and make sure he visited the loo before he left the house, and making sure he was smart and handsome. Well, the first part was quite easy. The second part, I think we're okay. All the few strange noises coming from the toilet before we left. And as for the third, well, if God can make it a smart answer, well, I think I've got a chance. <laughs> well, I've known Frank now for 20, for about 30 years. And ever since our first days at Ravens on school, we were both, we were both sweaty little school kids. His big passion in life was football and snooker. If I was honest, he was never ever good at either of them. That's true. My first memory of Frank was in the sports hall in our class football team, preparing to play an interform competition against another class in our year. Frank was in there before the game, bellowing out orders, pre John Terry mode. Saying words like, show passion, get stuck in, and if they go past you, just give them a good kick. A very friendly game, as you can probably tell. All I was thinking about was this guy is a proper leader who isn't afraid to get stuck in. However, on the pitch, my opinion changed completely. Every time a player run past, he would just put in the most feeble challenge you could ever see. And then 10 seconds after the player gone past, he would do the most ridiculous dive to the ground, holding his knees, screaming, foul ref, foul ref. And then shaking his head when nothing happened. Even at corners, you think being told of that, it usually gets to any ball that was in the air. Unfortunately, whenever a ball came over, all Frank used to do was kneel down, put his hands on his head, and shriek. But then I said to him, being the goalkeeper, what the hell are you doing, mate? His reply was, well, that ball's bloody hard, and he's done our third feature trade in it. <laughs> Needless to say, my opinion of Frank changed that day. But in all the years I've known Frank, I've always found him hard-working, honest, and a fairly decent guy. However, I don't see him very often, and I thought it would be a good idea to get some other people's opinions of him. Needless to say, they're a bit different to where I I only asked one person, and their replies to me when asked to describe Frank was lazy, ignorant, drinks too much, and needs to bath more. Well done, Emma! I was just going to say that, everyone's a person to smoke to. So, well done, girl. Well done, Emma. Anyway, a bit of history for you here. Strangely enough, I was actually uh, browsing internet and actually found that on the 10th of September 1934, and not many people will notice, um, but on this very day, 80 years ago, Alcatraz Prison accepted its first inmates. This was where young men were taken away from their families to lead a life of slavery and solitary confinement, and basically told to do whatever they were to be told by their masters. But as she seemed so sweet, I'm sure this was just a coincidence that Emma picked this day for the day of her wedding. Or well, maybe, Frank, you should be aware. <laughs> Well, I'd just like to say what a great honour it's been to this man today, and on behalf of the bride and groom, I'd just like to echo what I said earlier, and thank everyone for being here today, 
So if you would just like to stand up, glasses in hands, and raise a toast to Frank Emma. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.